You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. What you should expect to see in ministry. Now, it looks innocuous enough that in these <laughs> innocuous, harmless enough that, that the Apostle Paul in several places as we talk about the outros, and we're in a series called The Ins and Outs of God, uh, that in these outros that, that he, he gives these lists of shout-outs. And you might think that there is, there's nothing to glean from the Apostle Paul giving these shout-outs, but I, I would tell you that the Apostle Paul is showing us a picture of ministry in this passage, amen? And he's telling us what we should expect to see in ministry. Amen. As he talks about the people uh, that uh, he that he uh, uh, details here or or he gives shout outs to or kind of lists, the Apostle Paul is helping us uh, with our expectations for ministry. And I would tell you that that there is no body that goes into ministry that doesn't see themselves doing great things for God. Amen. When, 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 you, when you dream about ministry and you see that uh, when, when younger people will come to me and they'll say maybe they're thinking about starting a church or going into the, the ministry, I know that their eyes are, are big and they're wide open. And my heart just looks at them and it's just like, he just, you got no idea. I had no idea either, and it didn't quite, and it probably, most people would say, post pastors, preachers, those that start churches or ministries or are in ministry would say, it doesn't quite work the way you thought because you have a list of things that you want God to do, and if you can handle this, I'll handle this, and we'll be on and off to the races, and we'll have the big church, and we'll have this and that. Now, don't get me wrong, in 20 years, we have accomplished a great deal of things but still it didn't go the way I dreamed it and here the apostle Paul is is writing to uh, one of his one of his favorite sons in the ministry that he was that he was extremely fond of matter of fact in second Timothy he told him I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience uh, uh, he says I constantly remember you in my prayers recalling your tears I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy so this is his son in the ministry this is his this is his boy and so and he he's he sent him two letters that he wrote to him that were to encourage him and to support him and to help him set things in order in terms of pastoral ministry. He encouraged them in 1 Timothy 4 when he said, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity until I come. Devote yourselves to, the, to yourself, excuse me, to the public reading of scripture, to the preaching, to preaching and teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given uh, you through prophecy when the when the body of elders laid their hands on you be diligent in these matters give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress watch your life and doctrine closely persevere in them because if you do you will save both yourself and your hearers encouragement encouragement in, 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 in chapter 6, 20 and 21, he says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in doing so have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. And so he continues to encourage him when he tells him in 2 Timothy chapter 1, stir up the gift, fan into flame the gift of God, which is through you on the laying on of hands. And he tells him what you have heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So again, there's constant encouragement because 
the apostle Paul knows what it's like to be in ministry. Amen. The apostle Paul knows that you're going to need some encouragement. The apostle Paul knows it's not going to always be sunny days. He knows that there are going to be some, some tough times. There are going to be some, uh, some challenging times. And, and so it, it's, uh, it's almost like Paul uh, is encouraging Timothy because Timothy is the elder and the pastor at the church at Ephesus. But you know how you can see a, a, a car commercial and they'll tell you the, the big highlights and you can get excited about all of the features of the car. And then they'll tell you that it's zero down, zero percent interest rate. It's all of the highlights. But what the Apostle Paul wants to make sure that Timothy knows is not just the highlights, not just the zero percent down, not just the, the low monthly payment, not the twenty five hundred dollars cash back. He wants him to know about taxes, title, dealer prep. Come on, somebody. Delivery charges, document fees, all of the stuff that they say that's in the fine print that when you get there and you realize that the car that they even, mm, the car that they even advertise is not even available. We could give you that car, but we actually don't have that on the lot. But what we do have is this. And if you want to drive, this is what you're going to drive. Amen. That's the fine print, those things that must be emphasized so that a full picture can be seen. So the Apostle Paul, even in his shout outs, even as he talks to him, even as he as he concludes this book, this is the outro for for Second Timothy. He says, let me tell you a little bit about what you should expect to see in ministry by telling you about these people. Y'all, y'all better wake up. Y'all better wake up. Listen, listen, listen. The first thing the Apostle Paul says, this is, this is tough. He says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. He said, do your best to come shortly unto me. Why? For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Demas has deserted me. He has departed and forsaken me, having loved this present world. When you are in ministry, the first thing that you should expect to see people do is to desert the ministry. Jump ship. Desert the ministry. Demas, yep. the apostle Paul says, Demas hath left and departed and gone unto Las Vegas. He, I mean, to uh, Thessalonica. He has left. He has departed the ministry. I don't know what Thessalonica was about or what it was doing, but, but Demas was his, his guy. And, 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 and seven years ago when the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Colossians, and, and that same year he also wrote the book of, of Philemon, you see that, that Demas was what? Demas was with him. Amen. In Colossians 4 and 14, it says, our dear friend Luke, the doctor and Demas send greetings. And Philemon uh, 24 says, and so do Mark and Aristarchus and Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. So Demas was there seven years earlier, but somehow Demas did not want to stay on the wall. Somehow Demas said, I, I got to get out of here. I got to go. And the apostle Paul gives the reason. Demas deserted and he deserted the ministry because he loved the world more than he loved to see the appearing of his savior. Look at verse 8 of 2 Timothy 4 before the text. He says, when we, this is that, that, that very uh, well-known passage of scripture when he says, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have what? I fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not only to me only, but all those that love his appearing. And in the next verse, he says, get in stark contrast to those that love his appearing. Here you got Demas that walked out on the ministry, not because he loved the appearing, but because he loved this present world. And is gone on to Thessalonica. It reminds us of first John chapter two, 15 through 17. So 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 poignant so so descriptive it says love not the world 
these are the things that are in the world for the love of the uh, for, for, for love of the world, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That, that, that passage should be so familiar to you. It should be super familiar to you because we spend time talking about it all the time. Why? Because we have this challenge of wanting and desiring to please the world and to perform for its rewards and to conform ourselves uh, to its standards and to deform our view of God. That's what Satan wants. He wants you to pursue the world because if you're pursuing the world, you're not pursuing the things of God. And the scripture literally says here, the love of God is not in you. And why would the love of God not be in you? It would be because it wouldn't be demonstrated in you because how is the love of God demonstrated? It's demonstrated through obedience. It's not demonstrated through abandonment. Demons deserted the ministry. And I don't know what it was about about it but but as you know you should you and i should not love the world we should not love the world neither the things that are in the world why should you not love the world according to first john chapter 2 you remember it it says in verse 14 i have written unto you fathers because you have known what is from the beginning i have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of god abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one he's saying positionally you've already overcome the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith and so he says you've already overcome the world so why should you not love the world you are already already an overcomer you're going backwards and not forwards if you love the world and then you look at verses 15 and 16 of that passage which i just read into your hearing he says but if you love the world and the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride is not of the father but it's of the world the second thing is if you if you should not love the world because the love your love for god should not be overridden that's what you and I do when we start pursuing worldly things and fleshly things. We're literally, there's like an override button. We're supposed to be set on a certain course, amen? And then it's almost as if you and I will take the, the button and say, nope, I want to do manual control here. I'm going to hit the override. And when you hit the override, your love of God is overridden by your love of the world. So you should not love the world. Why? Because you're already an overcomer. And the second thing is your love of God uh, should not be overridden. And the third, and I think the best reason is right there in verse 17, when, when it, he lets us know that the love of the world is overvalued. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, abide forever if you love the world you're playing the short game and you need to be playing the long game Demas played the short game he played it for a while but then he was not with them and that reminds us of verse 19 of first john when he says they went out from us because they were not of us for if they had been of us they would have continued Come on, somebody, with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not of us. There are a lot of people playing church. And the Apostle Paul says, when you get in ministry, Timothy, and as you grow this church in Ephesus, you should expect people to depart the ministry because they love the world more than they love their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Depart the ministry, desert the ministry. But then you see Crescens and you see Crescens and you see, excuse me, uh, Titus. And there's a simple statement that, that, he, that he made when he says, and uh, 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 Crescens went to Galatia and Titus went to Dalmatia. You should also expect to see in, peop uh, in ministry people not desert the ministry, but people simply depart the ministry amen the main reason that people depart the ministry where it's not like it there's not there's not necessarily issue it's not a love of the world issue is simply because they move away 
their families move away to a different location and this location becomes inaccessible. Usually they move away because somebody has a new job opportunity. That has happened over and over in our ministry. We get some folks that leave, then we also get some folks like the Malones that leave and come back, God bless you. Depart the ministry, but then arrive at the ministry at the same time, amen? And so no, no hard feelings, nothing bad, nothing. It's like we wish you well. There's an opportunity and you leave. But I can tell you this, in every instance, in every category, we have had, a, I can give you an example of somebody that's done this. I'm not going to tell you who deserted the ministry, amen, because I just don't want to put that kind of business out in the street. But there were people that said, I would, I would rather pursue, mm, and okay, I would rather pursue a, a, a relationship with somebody who's married. And I know I can't do that and stay in this ministry at the same time because there's no place to hide when you're having an affair or trying to do something with somebody who's already married. And so this person had no choice but to say, I got to desert the ministry, left us hanging left us with responsibility, somebody who was involved in leadership. But be, because this person decided that they wanted that more than they wanted to be faithful to the ministry and faithful to the Lord, they decided, I got to bounce. So we got that example, and there's more. I just gave you one. But then you have folks that depart the ministry, and there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with departing because they're usually the reason that you will leave a church is really four reasons. And, 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 and the, the first would be incorrect doctrine. If, if somebody is preaching and teaching at a church that you're at and it's off, you, you, you got to bounce from there. Yeah, that, that's, you you got to get out of there. Inappropriate behavior. If, if, if my words and the leadership's words don't match their lifestyle, that's a reason to leave a church. The third reason would be instruction from the Lord. You prayed about it, and there's another, there's an opportunity. Is there something God is asking you to do, and you feel like you need to depart a ministry? You should only do that if there's instruction from the Lord. And this fourth one is the, is the main one. It's, the, it's an inaccessible location. You can't be at this church and be in D.C. at the same time. Amen. Just you can't get here every week, which is what you're supposed to be doing. Now that we've got a a broader, a broader lens and, and the opportunity in terms of being able to tap in through video and some other things. We do have a lot of people that have departed our ministry, but they are still a part of our ministry because they desire to be. They desire to stay connected. Matter of fact, I laugh and say that the church that I pastor that's not in this building is just as big as the church that is in this building. Amen. It's all of the folks that have moved away but are still connected. That's a, that's a good thing. It hurts, but it happens. Amen. Whether it's the Webbs or the Malones who came back, uh, 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 Ray and Lanisha who have bounced around two or three different locations. Praise God, I just got a chance to see him yesterday. Delvin and Tapita, but all of those folks are still a part of this ministry because we carry them here in our hearts and they carry us in their hearts. But depart the ministry, and, and if you don't understand that, you'll get in your feelings about what ministry is, but people depart the ministry. This, 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 this third person I love because he says only Luke is with me. Only Pastor Mark is with me. Not desert the ministry, not depart the ministry, but stay devoted to the ministry. Amen? This is, the, this is the ride or die category. Amen? Ride or die. They, they haven't moved. They haven't had an opportunity to move. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. But they're here. They're here every week. When you open the doors, they're here. Ride or die. Amen? We got a bunch of good folks that are devoted to this ministry. And we're adding folks that more recently you can tell the way they get down, whether it's Sister Hines, whether it's Sister Marcine, whether it's Tyler Nation, you could tell these are folks that are devoted to the ministry. They're going to be here till they're not here. Amen? <laughs> Ride or die. Sister Melanie, Sister Kelly, and Brother John, of course, Sister Kim. Ride or die. And in many cases, she would like to die instead of ride, but that's not really what we're talking about this morning. Dear God. She said, let's not ride. Let's just die. <laughs> but devoted to the ministry, amen? 
They show up, willing to work, want to make a difference. You need people like that. And then he has this, this fourth person. He says, and then take Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Now, there's a backstory that's there that, that's important for you to know. When the apostle Paul says, John Mark, grab him and bring him for he is profitable to me in ministry. The apostle Paul wasn't saying that in, in Acts chapter 15. Amen. The apostle Paul was like, that cat, he just don't have what it takes to grind. He just don't have what it takes to to kind of persevere, and so he, 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 he was like, we need to make a different decision. So in Acts chapter 15, sometime later, Paul and Barnabas said, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns that we preach the word of God and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it was wise to take it because he had deserted them and went to Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. I don't know if John Mark got seasick. He didn't like boats. His feet hurt. He had a cramp. I don't know if he had a, a ACL industry, but ACL uh, uh, injury, but something had taken him out where he was like, I, I, I just really don't want to go with y'all. And he's like, you know what? And now we're getting ready to go on another journey and do something. That cat can't go with us. And they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and then he sailed for Cyprus. And then Paul and Silas, then they went on the missionary journeys together. And so that's not what Paul was saying. But in, in Colossians 4 and 10, he says, my fellow prisoner, Aristarch, can send you greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And he says, you have received instructions about him, this Mark. If he comes to you, welcome him. So the Apostle Paul, something happened between Acts 15 and Colossians 4 where the Apostle Paul was open to saying, hey, welcome him when he comes. And now he's asking for him. You always want to see people that are, that are, that are um, devoted to the ministry, but you also want to see people that are drawn to the ministry. He says, I, 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 need, I need you to get Mark. If you can get John Mark here, we'll set this thing off. I need him. That, 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 that call has come out uh, for me over the years, and there have been a couple of people that have been trying to solve a way to get here and did that, like uh, Pastor Tyrus and Sister Angie, when he had an opportunity in Merck to go to a, duff, a couple of different places, but he found a way to get assigned to an area here, and it wasn't because that was the best area for him for Merck. It was the best area for him so that he could be here with his family and help build this ministry. Amen. Pastor Craig came back from, from Phoenix, Arizona, where they had, had, had planted a church and didn't know what they were going to do next. And so I said, why don't you come back here and let's rise and build together. So again, those are two great examples of families, pa Pastor Craig and Sister Donna, that were here for a time. Now, actually, both then departed the ministry because of jobs. One to Houston and one to Philadelphia. And so, uh, but, but that kind of back and forth, but drawn to the ministry and trying to solve and find a way to get here. Why? Because they wanted to do the Lord's work with God's people in this place. That's exciting as a pastor to say, I got folks that say, I'm trying to find a way. And if Kevin and Rebecca Claxon can ever get their butts out of Detroit, I'm telling you, they've been trying to get here for 20 years. Looking at jobs and postings and trying to find a way, it just never, uh, it never quite curled over. But again, that I appreciate the fact. It's like I'm trying to find a way to get there because we want to help build the kingdom of God in Chicago Heights with you. So being able to, pe to have people uh, be devoted to the ministry and drawn to the ministry is a, is a big deal. And then here's, here's this other one in verse 12. Antiochus, have I sent? to Ephesus. Timothy was in Ephesus, and so since the Apostle Paul wanted to see him, you see the Apostle Paul trying to make sure that he's got some bases covered. That's what it looks like. It's maybe for a time, for a season, but he's like, in order to speed your arrival here, I'm going to send Tychicus there. You should see in ministry, what you should expect to see is people deployed from the ministry. People that go and you lay your hands on them and you've trained them and they've had opportunities here and you get the opportunity to, to write a letter 
that they can carry with them that says, here is the, the giftedness that they have. Here is the skill set they bring. Here is the experiences they have. They have been faithful in ministry, and because they are moving to your area, I expect them to be able to plug in and be faithful in your ministry in these capacities. I've had the pleasure of doing that, particularly with Pastor Tyrus and Sister Angie, but he became Pastor Tyrus here. He left a church in Philadelphia where he was a member. He came here and worked and served and trained and became a pastor. So when we sent him back and when he went back to that same church, I had the opportunity to, to tell Pastor Hart, he needs to, this is just my humble recommendation, you're getting back an elder. You're getting back a pastor. You're getting back someone who is trained that can join your eldership at your church and build. And that's exactly what he's been doing, and that's exactly what Pastor Hart did. He accepted that, understood that, and, 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 and went with that recommendation. But that's, that's a pleasure to be able to say somebody has been deployed from the ministry. <sighs> but now this next category. And if anybody's been at New Life Christian Fellowship from 2005 and before, you know who this is, and you know what this is. Alexander, the metal worker, that, he did me what? He did me much harm. He did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on guard against him because he is strongly opposed to our message. Sometimes you get people that literally damage your ministry, damage your ministry. It, it's, it's, it's a tough thing. And you look at 2 Timothy when, when, when uh, the apostle Paul is, is saying to him that our study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the world of truth. But those next verses say, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in them will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and destroy the faith of some. So there, there is that, 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 that people that can do damage to your ministry. Some people don't want to leave. They want to destroy. They want to damage. Some people love the world and say, I got to get out of here. Some people have a heart for the world or have a twisted perspective on what should be happening in ministry, and they don't want to leave. They want to stay. They don't want to build. They want to tear down. They don't want to unite. They want to divide. And you can get into a place in ministry where you should not be surprised that there are people that want to damage the ministry. And maybe if we, if in its, in its best form, they didn't start out trying to damage the ministry, but they did damage the ministry. And when you pull them up on it and you're telling them you're damaging the ministry and they can either get back in line or they can get kicked out. And we have had that happen in our church. We weren't even three years old as a church. This probably should have broken up our church, but God was gracious and God was faithful and he did not allow that to happen. There was somebody who was in leadership and the highest part of leadership and pastoral leadership and this church was going to get ripped apart and I remember that we did something that was to, symbolic to, to help us to understand uh, how, how close we needed to be and, and how good our God was. Alicia Keys had a song out at the time called Unbreakable. Unbreakable love. We ended up getting wristbands, all of us, that had unbreakable and NLCF on it. And, and we talked about this love is unbreakable. And so we went through a, a, a period of time where, where that damage could have destroyed us, but it did not because God united us because we affirmed that we had an unbreakable love. And that was 17 years ago and it still hurts like it was yesterday and I know about this people that will damage the ministry and when you got somebody that wants to damage your ministry you don't you waiting for them to desert but if they don't you got to kick them out and that was a rough rough 
rough thing. I actually just spent some time with, with Brother Kevin last week talking to him about this because he, he didn't know the he didn't know the VH1 behind the music on that. And I was like, what? You ain't know? He's like, I wasn't here. I was like, you ain't know? <clears throat> and I took a deep breath. I was like, okay, let me give you, yeah, this has got to be the, the Cliff Notes version of this because it's just too much. It's too much to wade through. But the Apostle Paul is telling his boy, Timothy, you're my son. I love you. I'm letting you know when I'm talking about these people, you should be able to see their expectations in ministry that, of things that could happen. You could find somebody that will damage you in ministry is probably the same alexander that's from first timothy uh, uh one where he says holding on to the faith and good conscience which some have rejected among them or again this hymenaeus cat is off the chain apparently and alexander he's paired now with alexander who i have handed over to satan to be taught not to blaspheme so something was going on in the ministry and the apostle Paul says, I, 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 you got to have to deal with that, Timothy. There are people that will damage the ministry. And then there's this catch-all category. And this is kind of the disappointment of whom he said, Alexander, of whom thou should uh, uh, be aware, for he hath greatly withstood our words. And then part, the apostle Paul says, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook, forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. At some point in ministry, if you're going to stick around as long as I've stuck around in ministry, you will find people that will disappoint you in ministry. And the apostle Paul said, all men. He said, nobody stood with me. Not an individual at this point. The apostle Paul was like, let me, let me give you a group dynamic here. He said, when it came time for folks to stand with me, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. The Apostle Paul is, uh, we believe, writing this letter from the Roman jail where he is, and there was a period of time where people were with him, but as it happens over time, people start to fall off, and they just are not as vigilant around that. I can remember T.D. Jakes talking about the fact that if you're a pastor, you know, what will happen, you, you know, how the folks will rally to you if you got sick. Amen. And there'll be prayer vigils and they'll be brief. He said, but stay sick too long and they'll fall off. It just is not the same. And then they'll leave your church. He said, so you can be sick. You just can't be sick for long. It's like, well, I don't think pastor going to recover. It's been four days. Should we find someplace else to go maybe? It better not be four days, but he said, be sick for four months. Be sick for six months. Be, and again, so that, that's, that's what I think the Apostle Paul is maybe tapping into. He said, people will disappoint you in ministry, but I love this as, as we start to, to kind of land the plane, if you will. There are three words in chapter, in, in chapter 4 and verse 17 that are absolutely beautiful. It's the first three words of verse 17 notwithstanding the lord notwithstanding the lord that sounds a lot like but god amen that's what it is it's just that he it says it in a different way and he uses three words instead of two but 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 notwithstanding the lord you got to understand that no matter what happens as people are deployed from the ministry or they depart the ministry devoted to the ministry damage the ministry desert the ministry or disappoint you in ministry notwithstanding the lord but god you still got god you still have him why because if you're going to be in ministry you have to discharge your responsibilities regardless of what is happening around you regardless of the people that are coming or going regardless of what they do regardless of what they say regardless of whether they're faithful whether they are unfaithful you still have to discharge your responsibilities that's what the apostle paul meant when he says so that through the message uh through me the message might be fully proclaimed he said i've got a job to do and i have somebody that's going to help me do it and if i don't have demas notwithstanding the Lord. If, if, if Luke's not with me, notwithstanding the Lord. If Alexander tries to bring the ministry down, notwithstanding the Lord. 
Whether, whether people will come and go and people will disappoint you. He says, discharge your responsibilities and depend on the Lord. Why should you depend on the Lord? He gives you very three very good reasons right there. He says, you can depend on the Lord. Why? Because he said, the Lord stood with me. The Lord <laughs> stood with me. It reminds us of that God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, that you minister to the saints and do minister. God sees you. He's going to stand with you. He will defend your service. Amen. He, you can depend on the Lord because he's going to defend your service. He's going to stand with you regardless of what other folks are doing. And then it says he gave me what? He gave me strength. Not only did he stand with me, beloved, he <clears throat> gave me strength. And that reminds us I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He'll defend your service and then he'll deepen your strength. And last but not least, he said he will deliver, uh, he will deliver my soul. Amen. He says, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to him be glory forever and ever amen he says I did this and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion he's pulling in that imagery of Daniel in the lion's den that lions and people that are trying to kill me all around but God stood with me God uh, gave me strength and he delivered me from what the lion's mouth because he said in 2 Timothy chapter 1 I know the cause for I, I, I suffer these things nevertheless I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day he says I know who I'm rolling with and I know he'll deliver me from here to there from here to glory he's going to bring me all the way through why because I can depend on him because he stood with me he gave me strength and he delivered me and he will continue to deliver me because he is that kind of God. That's how our God gets down. And you would seem to think that that would only be for me as a church leader or as a pastor. But no, that, that, that's for you. That's for you. You've got a place in the body of Christ. You've got things that God has given you to do. You've got things that God has gifted you to do. You've got things you're sitting on that you're scared that if you actually do what God tells you to do, you might get disappointed. Well, let me let you know that you will. And being disappointed or expecting disappointment is not an excuse for not doing what God has called you to do. You will be disappointed. You could get damaged. You could get deserted. You could, you could start a program and look up and everybody is gone and it's just you. You might be at all those things, but you got to remember those three words that the Apostle Paul said, notwithstanding the Lord. I've got him. And because I've got him, he's got me. And so he's telling me, discharge my responsibilities regardless because he will deepen my strength. He will defend my service. He will deliver my soul because that's what he does. And you can see right at the end, that's why the apostle Paul breaks out in praise the way that he does. He says, and to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's what I'm going to say. After 20 years and... Countless people in all of those categories, some good, some bad, some hard, and some challenging. So many times that there is disappointment, but I've got the Lord, yes. and he's got me, he's got and I got to keep preaching, and I got to keep proclaiming because that is my responsibility. Says, as for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in bonds, that I might speak boldly as I ought to speak. It doesn't change. The program continues regardless of the landscape. The program is about the kingdom. Kingdom work. Kingdom purposes. A kingdom press towards a kingdom mark in glory notwithstanding the Lord. Amen.